Welcome everyone to the New England Real Estate Journal and the Middlesex Three Coalition Spring Real Estate Summit. I'm Rick Kaplan and my co-host today is Stephanie Cronin from the Middlesex Three Co- Coalition. Uh, I should mention I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England Real Estate Journal. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today, our platinum sponsors, Reamer and Bronstein, Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, our corporate sponsors, U.S. Pavement, no, we're going to go back, uh, U.S. Pavement, the Gutierrez Company, Window Construction, Ultragenics Pharmaceutical, Northmark, Windover Construction, I think I mentioned them, USCB, uh, Erling Construction, Northmark, and Allen Major, Allen and Major Associates, and Model Architects. This is a little about our partner, Middlesex 3. Anyone that wants more information, you can contact Steph or Stephanie. And our opening remarks will be from Sarah Stanton, the town manager of the town of Bedford. A little bit about the town of Bedford and what's going on there. Great. Uh, thank you, Rick. So, good morning, folks, and welcome to Virtual Bedford. The weather is glorious. Things are well. Well, we'll we'll get we'll get you going in a second, Sarah. Okay. Let me just uh, these are some of the uh, other life science uh, industry or uh, uh, industries in the Bedford area, and this is our first panel that will begin at uh, uh, ten thirty. And then our second panel, which will begin at 1130. And this is Ultragenics Pharmaceutical. And now I want to hand it over to Sarah Stanton from the town of Bedford. Great. So I was ready a minute ago. I'm ready now. Um, Thank you, uh, Rick, for the introduction. Uh, So just wanted to say a few words about Bedford the community that we have and the sort of burgeoning and welcoming life science and biotech corridor. Uh, Bedford is considered a biotech friendly place to be. We're a certified platinum rated bio ready community to the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council, having in place the infrastructure, the zoning options and available sites to accommodate new biotechnology enterprise. Companies choose Bedford because of our straightforward permitting practices. We follow the NIH guidelines and biosafety regulations, and we've changed zoning proactively for life sciences enterprise to allow buy right zoning in industrial zoning districts. Companies choose Bedford because of the already established and diverse culture and cluster of life sciences companies, including biopharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, and now biomanufacturing with Altergenics. Also benefit from being close to Leahy Clinic in Burlington and their world-class medical system. Uh, we're especially proud of most recently our new B2 Life job training program that we launched with our friends in the town of Burlington. Uh, the training program offers free training to those interested in starting careers in life sciences and healthcare. Bedford, if I don't say so myself, has a fantastic permitting team uh, led by our economic development director, who you'll hear from later, Elisa Sandoval that works closely with companies to get them started right here in Bedford. Uh, I'm sure Altergenics will attest to this, that when they were interested in coming to Bedford, Elisa and I met them on the side of the road in the middle of winter to tell them how great Bedford was and it worked out well and they're here now. So we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share the good work being done in town and for Middlesex 3 for hosting this forum. So thank you. And I went out a a little out of order uh, because I I was going to introduce uh, Stephanie before Sarah, uh, but I could tell how excited she was about what was going on in the town of Bedford. So now I want to introduce Stephanie Cronin of the Middlesex Three Coalition. Not a problem, Rick. Thank you. And and it's always a pleasure working with you guys. I do want to have um, two things I do want to uh, mention as well, too, though, is our second panel is not starting at 1130. It's starting at 12. Uh, because we're going to be doing a virtual networking in between as well, too. So hopefully um, people can stay tuned and get back on screen um, to to talk during that. 
The other is um, we are waiting for, for Jean LeClaire from uh, Mass Life Science Center to, to join the conversation as well, too. So if you see somebody else popping on screen, that's going to be Jean joining us. So, um, but, but, um, but again, thanks, Rick, for, for helping to put this event together. Um, for those of you who don't know the Middlesex Three Coalition, we are a regional economic development organization, which brings a private and public sector together to help address those business development concerns like uh, transportation, workforce development, infrastructure, real estate development. Um, and that's really the extent of the pitch that I wanna to give today, um, except to say um, that we do events throughout the year um, to, to promote our members, to promote the region. We have a small staff, um, but we really have a lot happening. So what we're gonna do is really just, instead of going into detail, we'll put the information in the, in the chat box about the coalition, um, but we will ask if you could follow us on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, or, or subscribe to our newsletter. And again, we can put that information in the chat box um, and that way we can give you more information in real time. Um, and one other thing, we are a membership-based organization. Um, so I wanna thank our, our members for your support throughout the last year. Um, if you're not a member, we'd love to have you as a member and we'll include that information as well too. Um, and if anyone's interested in participating in future events, whether they're virtual or hopefully in soon in, in person, um, we, we'd love, uh, please message me, e either chat, email, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, so with that, Rick, I think this is our fourth or fifth year doing these events together and it's always a pleasure. Uh, but we wanted to take a different focus this year and really focus on life sciences and what are the building blocks um, to, to attract and to grow life science and, and biotech companies and the impediments and the opportunities. And, and as Sarah said, there's a lot going on in, in Bedford, um, a lot of great life science companies, a lot of great companies that are coming and expanding. So obviously Bedford's doing something right. Um, and so we're going to discuss all of this during, during the panel discussion. Um, so... Um, with that, um, Rick, do I hand it to you, to Bob? Wait, let's let's get this conversation going. Okay. Well, I think, uh, you know, I'll just say a couple of words about the New England Real Estate Journal, that if anyone has any uh, or is interested in any information about what the New England Real Estate Journal, they can obviously contact me or contact anyone at the New England Real Estate Journal, and you can find us on the web. Uh, and I do encourage everyone to also become members of the Middlesex Three. And we have been partners for, I think, four years now, and we've been doing these. So I want to thank uh, the Middlesex Three for all they do to partner with us. And I also want to thank everyone for attending today. And now I want to introduce Robert Buckley of Reamer and Bronstein. He will be the moderator for the first panel. I hand it to you, Bob. Thanks, Rick. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Bob Buckley, Reamer and Bronstein. I had the land use uh, development uh, practice at uh, Reamer and Bronstein uh, along with my partner, Mark Vaughn. Um, I've also been, I was there in the beginning, Stephanie, at the start of Middlesex 3. I'm on the board of directors as well as uh, vice president. Um, I, it's an exciting panel uh, today. We have uh, Reed Joseph from uh, Redgate, a major uh, real estate developer, Dr. Uh, Galgawala. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. Um, who has told us that we can call him Dr. Zell or Zell. Um, and from uh, Beth Israel Leahy, uh, Omar Kosh uh, from UCB, and uh, Tom Platon from Ultragenics, and hopefully soon Jean LeClaire uh, from uh, Mass Life Science. Uh, it's an uh, interesting panel because we have users as well as developers. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you quickly to. Uh, maybe give a little bit of a, a, a summary of your background, and then we'll kick it off and get into the meat of the discussion. So, Doctor, I'll, I'll turn it to you first. All right. Well, thank you. Um, it's First of all, it's a great pleasure to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel this morning. I am uh, Chair of uh, Neurosurgery at uh, Leahy Clinic and uh, Professor of Neurosurgery at Tufts uh, University Medical School. And again, uh, just delighted to be a part of this, uh, very involved in clinical trials and uh, clinical research here at Leahy. Great, Tom? Good morning, uh, Tom Lazan, uh, Vice President of uh, Manufacturing at Ultragenics. And uh, I've been with the company for about four and a half years. Uh, we're building our first manufacturing facility in Bedford. So very excited to join the panel. Great, uh, Ona? Hello, everybody. Honor Kash. I head up the gene therapy vector core in our discovery organization uh, at UCB. Uh, I have been 
in the Middlesex 3 area working uh, for the past 15 years or so. Uh, so uh, thanks for the invite today. And uh, Reed. Good to see everyone today. Um, Reed Joseph, Executive Vice President at Redgate, a real estate investment advisory firm headquartered here in Greater Boston. You know, most importantly and recently, we actually bought a Class A office building here in Bedford, Hunter Crosby Drive, and we're repositioning the building and the site into a large life sciences and manufacturing campus. So we're excited about it and appreciate being a part of the panel. Great, great. Well, let me kick it off. Uh, something that I get questioned about a lot from uh, clients as well as those in the uh, municipal or governmental sector, uh, as the footprint of life sciences, and we'll get into maybe a differentiation of what those components are, expands, um, we have users uh, as, as well as developers. What are the criteria um, that, uh, let's, let's start with you, Reed. When you look at making an investment in the Middlesex Three Corridor, in particular uh, in Bedford or other uh, communities, what are, the, what are the boxes that you look to see that you can check before you make that investment? You know, I think uh, one of the biggest is just understanding the users and the tenants out there. And it's great to be on a panel with a couple of them. And the labor pool is so important, so critical to what these companies are doing and wanting to be in an area that has good access to labor in a, in a highly competitive market. So I think labor is one and the other is commitment. I mean, I think we've uh, jumped into this and we're committed to life sciences here, but you're in a town and an environment and a community that is committed to it. So I think that commitment both, you know, on all fronts is an ex is ex exciting to kind of bring all this, all the pieces together for an investment. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll switch to Tom as a user. Um, what are the things that you look at when you make that decision to locate it? So, so for us, there were a few different things. We actually looked at a number of different sites and facilities. And, uh, you know, I have to be honest, Sarah in, in the town of Bedford uh, was a pleasure to work with. And, um, you know, I remember that day when, when we visited the site, the Greenfield site. Uh, so, you know, it was clear that they were gonna work well with us to, to, to build this manufacturing facility. And I think, you know, again, it's people, people, people. So employee mm -hmm. development, uh, attracting and retaining the employees that we need to, to, to this facility is, is critical. So those are the two areas that I would focus on. Right. I'm going to make a shameless plug for Middlesex 3 here. Um, one of the, I think, strongest attributes of the organization, its ability to uh, connect users with the educational institutions that are in this corridor, be it Middlesex Community College, University of Lowell, Northeastern, to help to, to design and, and respond to the uh, educational needs or the training needs of those who are uh, located in this corridor. And um, I, I, if, if people are watching this uh, and uh, are interested, I strongly suggest you make contact with Stephanie Cronin at uh, Middlesex 3. She could put you in touch with the robust uh, employee network and training opportunities that exist here. Um, with that being said, um, maybe Ona, I, I know that uh, when we had the prep meetings for this, you were very passionate about your discussion about what the criteria uh, that you looked at and why you're happy that you made that move. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe tying into uh, gene therapy capabilities, which is uh, what we're building uh, in. Which Bedford. is what? Help me out. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's start from there. Yeah, so so gene therapy is um, modifying the expression um, of an individual's genes or correcting an individual's uh, genes by uh, administering a specific DNA or an RNA, um, and and potentially reaching to, to cures by uh, changing your genes, uh, which, you know, it's a, a good segue to UCB's uh, vision to move from symptomatic treatments uh, to disease modification and, and ultimately to cures, uh, which is what gene therapy has the promise um, uh, to deliver. And, and to be able to do all of these, uh, one needs a very multidisciplinary team. 
Uh, and that's where I think the location is important uh, because of access to world-class research institutions, uh, uh, expert researchers, uh, but also um, scientists who can do industrial research. Um, and I think Tom will appreciate this uh, with an eye to scale up uh, and, and to apply. So all of this needs to come together. And I think this location uh that, that provides them all you say industrial research are you talking about the production capabilities correct yes um and also um you know a little different from ac ac academic research which is also needed uh as a part of this multidisciplinary uh, team uh, but it is instead of solving the mechanistic and fundamental uh, issues it is more directing, you know, the resources and the intellect to to solve an, an ap applicable uh, problem, uh, with, with with an eye on helping uh, patients, uh, creating patient value at the end. The doctor, as being uh, affiliated with one of the the host products that I think a lot of uh, of the users and developers are focused on. Uh, Maybe you can uh, enlighten us as to the role that you see uh, Beth Israel Leahy playing in, in the expansion of the life science footprint to this region. Sure, I think there's two key points to make. One is that, uh, and uh, owner sort of uh, uh, alluded to this, but we are seeing patients coming to, uh, to Leahy uh, from New Hampshire, Vermont, Western Massachusetts. We're seeing a, a large catchment area that's growing. And uh, with the uh, BI merger, uh, even larger. And patients are increasingly uh, coming uh, to uh, BI Leahy looking for access to clinical trials. And that uh, um, uh, requirement or need uh, for patients is very, very important to us because we need to be able to recruit the right physician scientists to uh, the institution. And I can tell you, I've been at Leahy now for about nine years and seeing the growth in life sciences in the, uh, in the Middlesex region has been really, really important. Uh, it's been very helpful for us to be able to recruit the right people. We're in the process of recruiting a brain tumor surgeon from MD Anderson, who's gonna bring his young family here and, uh, and, and settled in this region. And one of the things that's attractive is the ability to network and communicate and build research programs for patients with the uh, life sciences uh, companies that are located in this region. So it's very, very important to us. I'm gonna throw this, uh, hi Gene. Uh, from, from the state standpoint, um, the recruitment aspect, I mean, do you see um, in a way what role that uh, from a macro standpoint, uh, to recruit the talent to leave the inner core, the Kendall Square, to come out here. It, it, do you get questions a lot about what's out there and, and, and how do you assist in that in that migration? Yeah, abs absolutely. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, definitely, what, one of the things that we do is talk to companies all day long. Companies we're trying to recruit to come to the Commonwealth. Companies we're encouraging to expand here. Talent, the labor pool is always the first topic um, that we talk about. And I do find that moving to the West, the options are, are increasing and we're seeing some great hubs popping up in Worcester specifically, as well as in the Northeast and the Southeast, Central Massachusetts. Um, and I think the, the most attractive part of the Commonwealth in general is this multivariable regional approach that we can take to the growth in life sciences. It really isn't just the Boston, Kendall, Cambridge Center. We've seen that expand, particularly with the increased access to transportation infra infrastructure, the increased responsiveness of other municipalities that, that want to offer TIFs, that, that want to encourage companies to come. We're seeing this sort of spreading because we've seen the good ideas play out already. And so I think other municipalities and other regional entities, Middlesex 3 has done a great job, um, I think, of marketing its area and I think the more that that, the more that we see that sort of scaled and mirrored across the Commonwealth, the more that we'll be able to replicate some of the success that we've seen in the life sciences growth over the last 10 to 20 years. I know in the prep discussions, there was a lot of focus on um, getting transportation to and from the, so let's say the, the city core out here. Um, um, 
another plug for Middlesex 3 is Middlesex 3 has been at the forefront um, early on starting its own transportation management association. So those on the, uh, on the uh, webinar who are thinking or are located here who are desirous of uh, enhanced transportation should again make contact with Middlesex 3. Um, let me ask a question. I'll throw this up as a jump ball. Do you find any resistance as the footprint expands, um, either from a user or an investment standpoint, to consider the Middlesex 3 corridor? I mean, when you try to convince someone who perhaps has a need in Kendall Square or Arlington or, or Watertown to look at this corridor, is there resistance? Do employees uh, complain about coming out here? I can jump in. Um, uh, you know, as as we are expanding and uh, interviewing different candidates, um, you know, depending on where their personal life is, uh, I have seen um, candidates prefer to be outside of the uh, the city. Um, uh, you know, so this Bedford area because of the the schools uh, systems that, that it has to offer comes up as a as a positive uh, in my experience. Good, good. Yeah, I I would echo that. I, I think from our perspective, and we were out in the market and talking with potential tenants, and we're hearing more and more that you know there's more interest today than there was three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, despite you know the Life science cluster has been here for a long time, but we're hearing more people excited about um, being out here in the region in Middlesex three, kind of in this corridor, both from, you know, where, where do people live and want to work? What's easy to get to the TMA, the shuttle service that does come out here for people that do live within the city. Um, but I think more, people are more and more feeling like, you know, they're actually honing in on places like Bedford. I want to be here, which is exciting. Right. Well, that's good to hear. I, I will tell you from my practice uh, and, and what I run into, I know that a lot of the communities are being very proactive in terms of uh, through their economic development directors, which 10 years ago, most communities wouldn't even consider having someone on staff. And now most of the communities have professional staff that are reaching out to the uh, the uh, private sector to try to say, you should consider us. As I tell clients, you want to be on that list of five. You know, when someone's looking for space, you want to make that, that you know, you want to be one of five that they're talking to. And I think we're finding uh, that a lot of the communities along the Middlesex 3 corridor are achieving that objective. Um, but one of the things I've noticed uh, is that the rapidity of change, just listening to some of the discussions here, uh, in terms of how the industry is changing, evolving through efficiencies, discoveries, need to ramp up for production, uh, that some of the regulatory scheme has not kept up with the, with the desire to establish and, and grow. And it's difficult given uh, some inertia that people are, are, re are reluctant to change um, to adopt uh, uh, re uh, regulations or templates that respond to the ever uh, rapidly ad advancing um, industry. So, and, and, and some of it is also, I think, because people don't understand what the industry entails. But I think we're, we're making progress through seminars like this or webinars like this or public discussions. Um, the, uh, the other thing I, I'd like to throw out there for maybe users as well as, as uh, developers, um, is anyone encountering or had any uh, issues with respect to the uh, existing uh, projected infrastructure capacity. You know, from a manufacturing, I know Tom, maybe you can. Yeah, no, no, I, I wouldn't say that's the case. And, and again, I think, uh, you know, for us, especially working with the Gutierrez company, working with the town of Bedford has been, uh, you know, especially, you know, it's a great relationship. So I think everyone from my perspective has been very supportive of that. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone I, else? Yeah, yeah. 
I'll just hop in just because you talked about um, the different communities and sort of the regulatory stuff. I feel like some of my previous life was an economic development, community development for small towns. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to keep in mind that it's not that every single town is going to host life sciences or biotech. It's that you're creating these small hubs that are doing great. Lexington, Burlington, Bedford are their own very strong cluster right now that even international companies I talk to are aware of. Um, and that's because they've done such a good job with recruitment. So it's not that you need every single town to be fully up, upgraded and ready with all the infrastructure and, and the support from the planning boards to, to redo their bylaws or anything. But you've got these really strong clusters. And I think building on those as they sort of grow out um, is a, a better recipe for success than trying to make sure that every single town has, has bylaws that will allow life science or biotech. Well, I, and I would I would echo that. Um, I think that uh, Reed, uh, one of his partners, uh, the former Secretary Bialecki, uh, used to always say that every town will identify what's in their best interest and pursue it uh, accordingly. So, not as, as you say, every town is not going to be a life science hub. Um, but I do think, and this is where this I, in the last ten years been a dramatic shift in thinking, is that. While a community may not have the infrastructure or the, or the desire or um, the, uh, the landmass or the opportunity to participate in that sector, they also could participate in other, word, uh, other ways, such as housing opportunities. Employees have to live somewhere. Um, and, and all of those things are interrelated and lead to a vibrant economy along the corridor so that you know, it's it's who are who is the what is the community? Who do they they desire to attract, and how do they integrate it with their with their neighbors? And that is a different way of thinking. It's no longer the fiefdom mentality that 15 years ago may have existed. That uh, everything stopped at the border of the local of the local community. Now they see how things are are connected. Um, so. Um, I, I'll throw it back to the, the, the good doctors who's on the panel. Um, what do you see going forward? If you had to look in your crystal ball, has the pandemic or the, 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 the exodus of uh, this um, uh, industry out of the city uh, to the suburbs, particularly the Middlesex Street Corridor, changed the way Leahy, uh, uh, B.I. Leahy is looking at uh, the world today? Yeah, no, I'm, uh, Bob, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that... Uh, Many uh, cities, Boston included, is seeing this uh, uh, migration of people uh, to uh, uh, areas uh, like the M3 region. And um, I think that's going to continue. Um, I think that uh, there's going to be a paradigm shift in uh, how people work and how people work in cities. And uh, certainly, I think, you know, we've talked about uh, hoping as this uh, pandemic wanes to get back to some sense of uh, normality. But that new normal is probably going to be uh, people working in their offices less than five days a week and therefore having a greater desire to make certain they've got space uh, at home and they've got land uh, around them. And so I think we're going to see more and more people looking to, to live in this uh, part of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, suburbs of uh, Boston. I think there's almost no question uh, about that. And one thing just to follow up on that you've mentioned, uh, the, the types of people that uh, these life sciences companies are attracting is, is very attractive, I think, to the, uh, to the medical community to have these uh, scientists and, and uh, other uh, life science leaders uh, in, the, in the neighborhoods. Um, it's, it's great for the schools, it's great for the communities, and it's great for recruiting uh, physician talent uh, as well. So I think that's a really important thing. But I think this is gonna grow and uh, it's been terrific uh, for at least over the last 10 years to see the growth in life sciences uh, in Bedford. Uh, I think also in Lexington and Burlington as well. Yeah, I, I think planning is a, uh, when, when I speak on issues of planning, I always take the time like good planning is 10 to 15 years over the, the horizon. Things that you see today in terms of development, uh, you know, were put in place 10 or 15 years ago and uh, people are surprised um, that it takes so long, and it, and it seems to go very quickly. Um, but I do think certain communities, I know, for instance, the town of Burlington has been very proactive in trying to position properties and infrastructure to attract and retain and allow those companies to grow. Um, and I know that Bedford um, um, is rapidly uh, moving in that direction. 
One of the things I'll throw out uh, uh, to the panel for discussion, and some could jump in, is you hear a lot of discussion in the marketplace about the users or the developers wanting to be part of a cluster. Uh, maybe someone could elaborate why that is so important. Why is it important to be part of a cluster? We saw it in Kendall Square. We've seen it, uh, you know, uh, in, in other in other areas. They tend to develop uh, the, this this uh, industry in, in cluster format. Anyone would like to comment on that? No one. <laughs> from a from a talent perspective, I I can take a stab at this. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, it's very common that we see um, similar type of work is being conducted right across the street from you if, if you're a part of uh, a cluster. Um, and, and, and that synergy, I think, um, helps accelerate uh, all, all the innovation that, that happens um, uh, in, in, in uh, Middlesex 3. But maybe so, Reed is in a better position to talk about I, from a. <laughs> I wanted to hear from uh, from you and Tom first before I, you know, s said anything. But you know, from my perspective, I think that there is, and I think owner, what you just said, there's two pieces to it. One is, you know, other companies have attracted labor and hired labor and been successful at you know, in a certain region in a certain area. So I think that's one just. When you see that happening, you say, oh, great, like I can do that too. It's hard, you know, it's not easy to move locations, hire a ton of people. And at the growth that these firms are having, and Middlesex County is one of the biggest, you know, labor drivers of uh, the sector. So I think clustering from that perspective, it's, it makes sense. Um, but th then there is the collaboration kind of, of, hey, we've got a bunch of companies pushing forward gene therapies and other things in this region and that get, you know, that builds on itself a little bit, but I don't, um, you know, so I, I think there's two pieces to it that I see, but um, you know, what we're trying to create is a, you know, being a part of an existing cluster in Bedford today with, you know, a, a ton of, a ton of activity and a lot of, a lot of existing users out here, but also trying to create um, what we have at hundred Crosby, you know, is a building with amenities where people can socialize and collaborate and and share a little bit for a more a multi multi tenant, you know, energetic environment. You know, through this discussion, there's been a, a common theme, which is the recru recruitment, retention, and you just hit the word amenities. Um, maybe Tom, uh, you could comment on are there certain amenities are more attractive than others to bring people to the location. Yeah, so so I agree on the amenity front. You know, one of the things that we looked at when we were, you know, selecting the site for the for the building was, was exactly that amenities. It was uh, restaurants, it was gyms, and, and attracting, you know, if you will, a younger uh, talent pool to the area, especially, was important for us. So so those are the things that we focused on. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find that people? Sorry, Go ahead. to add one point to that, I think that, you know, Reed made the, the comment about collaboration. And one of the things from a physician scientist uh, perspective, which I think is just absolutely crucial, is to have multiple life sciences partners uh, in the region in a cluster, so to speak, where you've got proximity and you can share ideas and ultimately build more successful um, uh, patient trials um, uh, for, uh, for the benefit of medicine. So uh, to me, I think it's just essential to, to see this type of growth and clustering. When, when we're talking to companies, that's the second thing. I said the first thing is always talent and labor, but it's also the collaboration, the networking. Companies are so excited to be part of what's going on out here. And I feel like we have such strong agencies and other entities that are built to support this industry, um, mass bio, mass econ, mass development, the state, mass office of business development. We all on Team Massachusetts, I feel like are so coordinated and collectively moving in the right direction in terms of pitching to these companies that when you come, you're part of the community. You're not a lone corporation that has to stand out there with one voice advocating for yourself. You're part of this, this whole team that we've sort of built here on collaboration of ideas, on sort of shared advocacy and a shared voice to make sure that we're all growing together. And I think that on a global stage, what we hear from companies is that that's coming across. 
Gene, maybe you're the right person to comment on this. One of the things that, uh, since I've been involved with Middlesex 3, that and, um, I've been very impressed with, which frankly, before I got involved, I really wasn't that aware of, is a collaboration between the academic institutions and the state, as well as the users. I know that if you haven't met Judy Burke uh, at Middlesex Community, I would, she's she's probably one of the most, uh, the strongest advocate for a strong uh, workforce development program uh, throughout uh, this region. But maybe uh, is there outreach? Do, do you bring those institutions into your dynamics? Because I know that Middlesex 3 has been trying to bring them into the the user format so that programs can be designed specifically for a user that needs certain talent skills. So. Definitely. P I, public private partnerships are a big part, I think, of the strength of the Massachusetts life science system in general. And we have a few different programs. I feel free to message me later, anybody about specifics about our programs, but we do have specific grant programs set up to incentivize public private partnerships that would have one private company partnering with a hospital, university, research institution, usually around solving one specific, particularly challenging problem. Um, a lot of times that's around data science. Sometimes those can be really expensive to solve. And there's entities like our academic institutions or our hospitals that have access to these large amounts of data sets that a company might need in order to be able to solve one of their particularly pressing problems. And so we're there to sort of make that connection, make the introduction, and also if we can um, support the actual project. So we're finding different ways to do that. On the workforce development side, community colleges have been a specific focus of ours. We've seen some great successful partnerships with the entire Massachusetts community college system. Right. Well, let me ask, uh, I'll throw this out too. We've all gone through in the last uh, 15, 16 months a, a total upheaval in the way we we work, uh, we recreate, we live. Um, and I, I'm curious whether the industry who has been at the forefront of terms of innovation and production and delivery of, of, of medical care and, and uh, products uh, to hopefully get us out of this situation, um, what's the prognosis? Um, what do you see going forward? I mean, uh, let's start uh, with, with Dr. Zhou. Uh, do you see uh, any change in the way you deliver med uh, medical uh, services or the need for additional capabilities in the life science industry to assist you in the performance of your uh, talents? Yeah, that's a great, great question and an important one. And I think that perhaps the largest shift that we have seen, which I think you know uh, hospitals and, and medical centers all over the country rapidly pivoted to telehealth. And uh, it in large part was, I think, very successful. And I think, as I mentioned about you know, the office place, I think what we will see is a new normal will include uh, patients uh, seeking medical care from their homes uh, and interacting with physicians uh, uh, you know, remotely. What that means, I think, is that as we look to our industry partners, as we look to life sciences partners, that we are going to need very rapidly to develop better tools to acquire data from patients that we normally would get face-to-face. Uh, -face. So, you know, wearable technology, um, other types of uh, technology that allow us to access, access devices uh, that, uh, that patients have. Uh, so that we can, you know, uh, figure out what their heart rhythm is without having them come in to, uh, to get an EKG in the uh, clinic. These are going to become very, very important. And, uh, and I think we will look forward to um, working together to develop those types of uh, technologies and to ultimately demonstrate that it creates benefit for, for patients in the long term. It certainly will create convenience, but, uh, but we want to make certain that we're getting the data that we need from patients so that we can take good care of them. And uh, that will require some technical innovation. So doctor, I can call on you the next time we represent Leahy on an expansion that you could testify that you're going to improve traffic flow in the area because you're going to have technology to provide the data without coming to the site. Well, Boston needs help with traffic <laughs> for sure. So anything we can do, uh, we would like to do. All right, all right. Um, and that, Bob, that's one of the things that, I mean, I think you, we touched on it earlier just from, you know, telehealth, you know, commuting, how many people are going into the office, how many days a week. I mean, all this is still playing out live, but the life sciences industry, I mean, can't go remote full time, right? I mean, these people need to be in labs and um, 
that's one of, you know, interesting as you think about where you want to be, but also, I mean, I mean, they need the real estate um, in a way that, you know, I know office and other areas, people are still trying to figure out, right? How many days do employees want to be in? But the life sciences industry need, needs to be there. No, that, that, that's true from a manufacturing perspective. You know, clearly you're going to have staff full time, three shifts, uh, you know, seven days a week. Uh, the, the other consideration is, is for me, um, you know, the pandemic has put uh, a lot of strain on supply on the supply chain side. So I think you're going to see you, you're, you're seeing longer lead times for equipment, longer lead times for materials. Thus, I think being able to store these materials offsite is going to be important in having warehousing offsite, cleaning services that specialize in, in, uh, in viral, you know, decontamination, things of that sort uh, as well. You know, in my practice, I've already seen a demand for uh, logistics or offsite uh, warehousing of, of uh, not just delivery and distribution, but uh, also for product for users, um, um, they want to have the, the their prime space dedicated to research and activities. So, uh, well, let me throw another one out, another question, which is, um, if someone could talk about the relationship between the the emerging industry out here and the growing industry and the clinical trials, I suppose that Leahy play, uh, Beth Israel Leahy uh, plays a major role in the clinical trial aspect because it is a, a host location to conduct those trials, but um, I don't know if anyone can comment on what what is being developed there, or is that a critical component of coming here? Clearly in the city it is, but are clinical trials being uh, expanded and uh, uh, are the users uh, trying to capitalize on that expansion? So maybe I could speak to that first. Um, I think there's no question that uh, more and more patients are seeking access to clinical trials uh, here at Lady in uh, Burlington. And, uh, and that's a, um, uh, uh, a need that we are filling. And uh, we're filling by uh, recruiting uh, talent here, uh, by developing relationships with uh, uh, companies in the uh, region. Uh, to, uh, to uh, develop clinical trials that, uh, that are very meaningful. One other point that I think is worth mentioning is that as we think about clinical trials, um, we are starting to think about these uh, things from a more patient-centered uh, uh, perspective. And that's something that I think Leahy in particular has really focused on. And so when we talk about you know, gene uh, therapy or we talk about other new uh, biologics and so forth, more and more patients are very concerned about, uh, you know, they want to have their disease treated, they want to have their disease managed, but they're increasingly interested in what does this new treatment mean for me? What does the safety look like? What is my activity going to be like? What's the surveillance like? And so forth. And so we've involved patients uh, very much in uh, the design of these types of clinical trials. And uh, we aim to do that more and more so that the information that we generate uh, from doing these clinical studies not only helps us understand which treatments are the most effective, but what effective means to individual patients, because it means different things, and we need to pay attention to that. Um, I completely agree with you, though, there. Uh, at, at UCB, you know, patient value is at the heart of what we do, and I think that this collaboration between, you know, the neurosurgeons, um, how does... Uh, uh, the, what are the hesitancies of the patients towards a, a, a gene therapy uh, uh, or, or other aspects that you, that you have described um, are very important in, uh, and, and they directly impact early drug discovery uh, at, at UCB and you know, bringing it to being a part of the hub, uh, it all accelerates uh, all of this, I think. Absolutely right. Yeah. One, of, one of the, uh, uh, I, I would say, the uh, benefits of the emergence of this industry is the impact it has on other aspects of the, the economic development of this corridor. I mean, we've spent the last 20 minutes or so talking about how delivery of medical or, or pharmaceutical uh, uh, is going to affect the patient and, and the, the data collection. 
which I think is going to lead to cybersecurity development and, and information technologies in this corridor, which uh, has a strong uh, uh, background in, in uh, talent pool, as well as uh, we've been discussing amenities. So to the extent that this industry grows, prospers, and, and uh, leads to further economic development, uh, we all benefit because I do think that some of those other areas are going to be very critical uh, to help uh, rejuvenize or maybe reinvent the office market in the area and uh, some of the uh, uh, services that are provided to the employees that uh, make this their, their life's work to uh, participate in this development. Uh, I will throw this out. Uh, it, it seems to be such a rapidly expanding and evolving area. Uh, one of the uh, things that I've tried to highlight uh, when I speak to municipalities about their zoning or their regulations is that the need for flexibility because um, things things are moving at a breakneck speed and as, as those on the uh, uh, panel can attest, the financial investment in these facilities is extraordinary. So you have to be able to not only start here, but grow here. And to the extent that municipalities through their regulatory scheme, without giving up control, but uh, incorporate flexibility, I think is critical. And I, I don't know if there are any panelists that would like to uh, share their sentiments on that. Well, may I, may I start here? Uh, so we, we started uh, building our gene therapy capability in the beginning of the, the pandemic. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Sarah Stanton's teams uh, at Bedford, uh, they really understood the situation, adapted uh, and, um, uh, you know, incorporated these virtual inspections and uh, in included that flexibility to get us up and running in the middle of the, the pandemic, which, which was crucial. And I think, Bob, you hit, you, you, you hit uh, the detail of you not only need to build, but you need to grow also um, in the same um, region. Uh, so so it, it, both of them happening at the same time. Uh, and, and, I, and I can say that uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the town of Bedford's uh, ease uh, and the and the uh, flexibility that they that they provided with the permitting process for us. Right. Yeah, I think. I mean, go ahead, Bree. Sorry. Yeah. No, adding to that, I I think echo the exact same feeling. I mean, we've come in with a an existing building that we're going to reposition, and um, for life sciences, and the town's been very encouraging, flexible, and they're committed to the vision as well. So not only what we need to do there, but in permitting additional development, additional expansion here, we talk about growth of these companies and growth of the sector, growth of the cluster. And, you know, we're working to add additional density and the town's been um, very flexible in how they've been willing to think about this in the past. And, you know, hearing the stories of how they've, how committed they've been, how helpful with companies specifically in terms of you know, we understand speed is really critical, right? In all this market, right? Everything owner said, and, you know, we're trying to get companies or trying to get cures, <laughs> trying to get research out there, clinical trials and time and speed is important. So having a, having a town in Bedford today, that's, you know, that understands that and is willing to work, work to get there with you. And that's both as landlord, owner, developer, and tenant. I mean, everyone needs to work together. So it is exciting and very helpful. I mean, speed is really important. May I add to that, uh, Reed? So speed is especially important for gene therapy. Um, uh, first to market is always important, but uh, if you really are trying to deliver the patient value, um, you need to be first uh, for, for, for this new modality uh, because uh, one promises cures and you end up curing uh, the, the existing population with the genetic defect uh, very quickly. And then uh, the demands change to an incidental rate 
uh, and also facility sizes and flexibilities come into play there as well. So the differences, the nuances in the modality exacerbate, I think, the need for speed, if you will. Let me, let me follow that, uh, follow up a lot with a question. How does gene therapy manufacturing differ than traditional pharmaceutical or uh, you know, other types of uh, life science manufacturing? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we, we talked about treating the symptom to maybe dis- modifying a disease to a cure, right? So uh, currently what we do with the protein biologics is um, in, a, in a lab, um, in a stainless tank, we produce a certain protein and purify it and make it safe to inject into human to treat the disease every three months or so, for example, right? In the case of gene therapy, we change, we do one injection, that's the promise, uh, and you change your cells, the, the, the code in your cells, and you enable your own cells to become the factory of the drug. So you only apply it once. Um, this is the, this is a promise. Only a handful of them got approved, but uh, it's in the works. It's happening. So uh, it, it completely changes the business too. Uh, and uh, how uh, companies like us can create pa- patient value changes and the timelines around the changes that I described. And it's also important to recognize that all of these industries are very highly regulated because uh, both at the federal and state and local levels. So I'm supposed to ask you why you have the title VectorCore? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Vector means um, vehicle, actually. Um, so I know no one wants to hear about viruses, but um, we are capitalizing on the thousands of years of evolution that the viruses have gone through to engineer viruses and use them as our delivery vehicle. Um, these are safe viruses that are not replicating and causing disease, but um, engineered to, to have the, the, this key piece of uh, genetic information uh, to deliver a cure. So vector comes, <laughs> comes from there. And core is, you know, we're the specialist to, to design and produce the vectors. That's, that's it. Well, as we wrap, as we wind down on this uh, segment of the uh, summit, um, I'd like to each of you maybe to give a, a, a summary of uh, what you see your, um, I don't want to say your projection, but maybe it is a projection, uh, how you feel going forward. And, and if you had one thing to ask uh, the region to focus on, what would that be? Dr. I do not. Oh, 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 no, go, Gene. <laughs> I was just too excited to talk about this. Um, I, I'm so excited and proud of Massachusetts. I feel like the last year has been such a good year for ideas, necessity, mother of invention. Um, and I've just seen so much, we've seen so much innovation, particularly from small companies. And I, I'll point out, we first funded Moderna in 2011, and it was considered a risky investment. And they made the case, well, our messenger RNA technology might become really useful someday. We're not sure. We'd appreciate the support early on. Who knows? And seeing that pan out as a homegrown company from that investment has been, I think, evidence of the idea that sometimes it's a small company with a new idea. It's innovative. You might not understand it at first, but it's important that we support small companies and just not just try to attract the next massive global corporation to create 500 jobs in one town, but create this, encourage the small companies to continue to grow and expand here because that's what we've already seen change the world. Great. Tom? I I completely agree with that. Sorry, I, I completely agree with that. And I'd just like to add that um, one of the things that I think is, as I sort of look uh, to the future, is uh, how important it is to uh, bring uh, patients to the table um, on this. And I think the more that they see growth in the life sciences, the more that they see uh, investment in innovative technologies like gene therapy in their region, um, the better it is for um, all of us as we collaborate together to find uh, new solutions for um, uh, patient disorders. One of the things that uh, you'd ask Bob about the uh, differences between say gene therapy and um, you know, other uh, life sciences and pharmaceuticals. And one of the things is patients. 
you know, uh, I consent people for neurosurgery, which is a scary concept for patients, but for patients to hear about their genes are going to be changed um, is a very scary concept. And I think we all have to work together to make certain that as we advance the science, we're also advancing the information and the education around what these technologies mean, um, how safe they are, and in fact, demonstrating that they are safe, um, which, uh, which I think we'll be able to do. The mRNA uh, vaccines, I think, are a great uh, example of that. This is new technology. This is making your body produce, ultimately, the proteins that would fight the virus. And uh, it's, it's a strong step towards having the public have an understanding of what these new technologies can do for them. I couldn't agree with you more. I haven't spent a number of evenings or meetings with uh, municipalities trying to permit a, a, a facility and the information that you have to um, provide so that people get a comfort level of what's going on behind those doors, that it's nothing to be fearful of and there are controls. It's a highly regulated industry. But I think over the last 15 months, I think the educational level of, of most Americans has been enhanced. And, and I think that uh, the benefits of coming out of that understanding uh, are yet to be seen and appreciated. So Reed, I'll throw it over to you. Uh, you know, I, and you're asking for everyone's perspective as a you know developer and landlord in the region. I mean, we're committed to life sciences here in Bedford. And, you know, we've got a, a 300,000 square foot building that we're moving full steam ahead to reposition. So we, we look forward to continued growth of, you know, I, I like the idea, new ideas, new companies, um, and continued growth in this cluster. Uh, that, that's exciting for us um, across all areas of life science manufacturing, and it's exciting to see. Tom, any final thoughts? Or? Yeah, so, so for me, you know, what excites me is really, you know, what had been, what Zohar had said previously, patience. So we are, uh, you know, focused on patients, uh, a passion for patients, a passion for, for people. And, and I think, um, you know, when I look at gene therapy, especially just the explosion of growth over the last few years, especially, in, and I did want to touch on manufacturing. For me, you know, what, what's different or what's been amazing is to watch the growth from what essentially was manufacturing in plasticware the manufacturing in, in 200 liter vessels and, and even a 2000 liter scale for gene therapy, which is, which is uh, unique, I think. So, so seeing that growth uh, reminds me, you know, of antibodies 10, 15 years ago and this explosion of growth is, is really so exciting to watch. And, and honestly, you know, building your own, your first manufacturing facility from a pharmaceutical perspective, from a manufacturing perspective, there's nothing more exciting than doing that. And I'm mm -hmm. uh, really excited by that. Uh, my ask is is more from, you know, what had been said previously, people. You know, you had mentioned Middlesex Community College. We have a strong relationship with them. Employee development, training is especially critical to what we need to do. Omar, you want to? Yeah. Um... Echo everyone. Um, I, I think with the pandemic, our industry being considered as essential uh, was the seal and you know the proof of uh, of, of that of that fact. Um, and I would say with um, uh, gene therapies, because of the reasons we've described, that you need the speed, but there's so many unknowns and uh, fundamental answers that are needed. Uh, I think this strong relationship between you know, world-class institutions with research to understand the fundamentals, but at the same time, uh, accelerating with what we know to deliver uh, uh, these much needed drugs uh, to, to rare disease patients now requires, uh, as Tom described, going to larger and larger manufacturing uh, sizes uh, as we solve how to, uh, increase the productivities by uh, fundamental science. Um, and there's no better place to do it uh, because we have access to all here. I can't say it better than you just said it. So I want to thank you all for participating. Um, I'm going to turn it back over. I think it's time to turn it over to, uh, to Rick and uh, Stephanie. Uh, but uh, 
All I ask is you keep up the, uh, the excitement in this area because I think we will all benefit from uh, the uh, growth of this industry in many ways. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in for just a second, Rick, if I could. And, and, you know, and I know that we went over our time a little bit, but honestly, I could have listened to you guys for another hour. And, and uh, uh, w listening to you, there's a lot of optimism, but frankly, a lot of pride of what's going on in our region as well, too. And I know I'm a little biased, but really, there is a lot happening in this area. So thank you for, for coming for all the information. Um, Bob, thank you for, for moderating. Um, Dr. Zoe Reed, owner, uh, Tom and Jean, I appreciate all your time. And, um, and Rick, I know I just jumped in in front of you, so I'm going to turn it over to you. No, well, I also, I wanted to thank everyone. I, uh, Bob, great job as a moderator, as always. And, I, you know, I, I was just uh, so well informed <laughs> by all of you that today. Uh, great information. And this is something that uh, I, I think more and more people should understand because this is, uh, this is our future. Uh, now we have the ability to maybe live to uh, 150 years old. I don't know if we want to, <laughs> but we have the ability to. <laughs> uh, I'm just waiting for Tom to play the uh, guitar, you know, before we leave. <laughs> uh, that, that's uh, um, that's my son's guitar, not mine. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I want to thank you all again, and we're going to move on to our networking. And, uh, you know, you're all welcome to stay uh, through the networking, and then we move on to our next panel. And that will also be very informative, I'm sure. So please stick around. Uh, we are going to be switching everyone over as, uh, as part of the networking begins. So hang it, in there with us. It, it, we may want to let people know that we're switching them over to be panelists so that when their, their name comes up, if they have their video on, it's they're, they're going to be. I well. can embarrass you. So <laughs> please do. <laughs> <There you> uh, <laughs> but, but if people want to turn their video off and stretch your legs, go get uh, lunch or a cup of coffee or something, um, feel free to do that as well, too. Um, yes. But if, you're, if your camera's on, you're, you're fair game, right, Rick? And you're, That's you're right. Calling people then. Good. You definitely have fair game. And um, before we go to that point, I, again, I'd like to thank everyone that is has attended today. I'd like to thank everyone that is participating as panelists as well as moderators. Uh, this is uh, an event we do annually with the Middlesex Three Coalition. I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England Real Estate Journal, and you'll see on the screen also Stephanie Cronin from the Middlesex Three Coalition. Uh, this is our Spring Real Estate Summit, and there, there we are, the two of us. I hate that. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Stephanie? No, I'm sorry. You, you keep going. I'll jump in after. Okay. And I want to thank our sponsors for today. Without them, we can't do things on well, like this. I want to thank our platinum sponsors, Reamer and Bronstein, Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, our corporate sponsors, U.S. Pavement Services, Ultragenics, Erling Construction, The Gutierrez Company, Northmark, Allen & Major Associates, Inc., UCB, Windover Construction, and Moggle Architects. And this is a little bit more information about the Middlesex Three, and I do encourage anyone that has attended today to find out more information about Middlesex Three Coalition, and, and please join become a member. They're very helpful and they can do a lot for your business and make a lot of great connections for you uh, going forward. And Sarah Stanton, um, everyone always makes fun because I don't, sometimes I don't say the first Sarah or Sa Sarah. I don't know if I say it right at all. <laughs> but uh, Sarah Stanton is the town manager in the town of Bedford and she had a some opening remarks and if you want more information about the town of Bedford I'm sure Sarah would be happy to talk with you. A little bit more information about the town of Bedford and I'll give you a couple of seconds to go through that if and this is also being recorded so you'll be able to find it on our YouTube channel 
on the New England Real Estate Journal website, as well as on the Middlesex 3 uh, website site as well. Uh, this is some of the other companies that have joined into uh, the town of Bedford. So, you know, obviously they're, they're attracting companies in the life science industry. So Rick, can I jump in for just a second sure. as well too? Because I know we went through this earlier and we don't have a heck of a lot of time. Um, and we have a number of people who are, are, are joining our, our conversation. So I, I don't know if we need to be going um, put through, through the PowerPoint, but I'd, I'd love to hear from the people who are on the call, um, whose videos are up, because we still have our panel here as well too. I'd love to hear if, if anyone wants to jump in with feedback, or not feedback, but questions or thoughts or just get the conversation going as well. Yeah, too. we're gonna go right to that right now. And that's our next panel that will start at 12 o'clock. Okay. And, and anyone also, I know a number of people put their contact information into the chat box too, but please keep that going as well too. And we'll send that to everybody. This is our Spring Real Estate Summit. And the, most of you have been to our past uh, summits and uh, we've always enjoyed great audiences and great speaking, speakers. So I wanna thank everyone for being part of this for so many years, as well as our partner, the Middlesex Three Coalition. Uh, this is who's hosting it today. It's I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England Real Estate Journal and Stephanie Cronin from Middlesex Three Coalition. And uh, these are our sponsors. I'd like to thank them again. Uh, Platinum sponsors, Reamer and Bronstein, Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. Our corporate sponsors, U.S. Pavement Services, Inc., Ultragenics Pharmaceutical, Erland Construction, The Gutierrez Company, Northmark, Allen & Major Associates, Inc., UCB, Window of Construction, and Mogul Architects, or Mogul Architects. <laughs> uh, and this is a little more about the Middlesex Three Coalition, and we're going to move on. Uh, this is our, our, our panel that will be coming up. And our moderator is Alyssa Sandoval. Sandoval. Uh, she is the Director of Economic Development on the town of Bedford. Did I say her last name correctly? Maybe not, but <laughs> that's, that's, my, uh, that's my thing. I got to screw up everyone's last name. <laughs> so I want, at this point, I want to introduce Alyssa and uh, she will then introduce the panel. Thank you all again. Hi, Rick. Thank you. Um, I actually have to correct my first name as well as my last name. Um, it's Elisa Sandoval, and um, I am the Economic Development Director with the Town of Bedford, and welcome to Panel 2, um, which is a focus on the Ultragenics Biomanufacturing Facility and um, the project in Bedford, and we're just going to dive right in. I would like um, the panelists to just do a quick intro um, of themselves before we go any further. Uh, so let's see, Scott, would you like to start off? Sure, be happy to. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining. Thanks for having me. Uh, appreciate it. Scott Weiss from the Guterres Company. Uh, we are a um, uh, Burlington-based regional um, uh, real estate development and construction and property management firm. Uh, proud to be working in, in Bedford, proud to be uh, associated in working with Ultragenics as well. So uh, thanks for having me and having us here today. And Gil? Hi, everybody. Gil Stevens, I lead global engineering for Ultragenics. I think Tom probably covered, you know, what Ultragenics is engaged in. But um, just hit it once again, you know, we're, we're going after medicines to treat rare and ultra rare uh, genetic diseases where there's currently um, no existing therapies. And Peter? Yes, good afternoon. Thanks, Lisa, for uh, leading this. It's, it's always a thrill to be back with you and Sarah, as well as with Scott and the rest of the Guterres gang. That's uh, any kind of um, project. It's always sad when the project, uh, we are part of the project winds down. So my name is Peter Cardi and uh, I'm director of global real estate for Ultragenics. I've been with the company for about 16 months now. 
and um, Lawrence. Do you, would you like Lawrence me to call you Lawrence or Jay? What's your uh, we'll, preference? We'll start with Jay. How's that? Jay. Okay, Jay. So I'm Jay Sturdivant. I am a project executive with Erlen Construction. I head up the uh, Advanced Technology Life Science Group. Uh, Merlin is a 40 plus year old company. We have four divisions, a uh, residential division, a, a uh, school and uh, business division, a special projects division, and then we have our advanced tech life science group. Great. So I think for our audience, I'd just like to, um, for the panelists to do a little overview of the project, just, um, you know, just kind of highlight what is this project? What is this facility? And then also, what is the what is the need that it fills for you? Um, so, Ultragenics, Gil or Peter, I don't know if you want to lead off on that one. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, for Ultragenics, the, this project represented the first internal GMP manufacturing of our portfolio of gene therapies. Um, you know, we have a real exciting uh, portfolio. Uh, a number of them currently in clinical trials. And, um, you know, we really saw the need to internalize manufacturing to help us, uh, I think in the first panel, folks were talking about speed, speed to market. Um, you know, this is something critically important to us because again, we're going after these rare genetic dis diseases where there's currently no therapies. So the faster we can get these through development and commercialization, the faster we can help our patients. So. Uh, speed is very critically important to us. Um, so having our own facility uh, with our own capabilities, with our own staff, really helps to drive that. And, um, you know, we, you know, we are still planning on de being dependent on the, the, you know, commercial supply chain in terms of, you know, contract manufacturing, con contract to development and research uh, expertise, but um, really bringing it in-house gives us a, a step change in our ability to get, get products to our patients. And Gil, I, I think you maybe understated the, the gene therapy aspect of it. This is a, certainly a life science manufacturing site, but the gene therapy makes it a little bit novel, right? And I know that uh, from the real estate perspective, when uh, we were going through the process negotiating with multiple landlords, with Gutierrez, et cetera, that uh, some of the major, major life science property owners around the country approached us because they have a hole in their portfolio. They don't have gene therapy manufacturing. So even though, the, even though they have tens of millions of square feet of life science space, they didn't have this particular kind of manufacturing. So all the more exciting for the town of Bedford and for Altogenics. Yeah, so the, you know, just scale wise, it's, uh, you know, about a hundred thousand square foot facility, a little bit bigger than that. And um, as I said, we'll have the ability to manufacture um, uh, both drug substance and drug product for our portfolio of gene therapies. And, and it, it was interesting, Gil, is that uh, we were interviewing people recently, and one of the candidates was from a major West Coast life science company and was bragging about the fact that he had just built a gene therapy manufacturing site. And when I asked him how big, he said 6,000 square feet. So your 100,000 square feet is off the charts. Wonderful. Um, Scott, did you want to add anything to that or? Uh, in terms of the uh, project itself, um, obviously we're, we're thrilled that um, Ultragenics chose, you know, Bedford, chose Bedford Woods in our location uh, uh, here to, to um, uh, bring their facility online. So, and, and we're thrilled that the, with the partnership uh, with both uh, the town of Bedford, with you, Elisa, with Sarah, uh, and the team to, to sort of, uh, not sort of, to get ourselves in this, this site and the town ready to receive and be able to partner with uh, Ultragenics and their team so that we could uh, help bring this, this project forward. So great partnership uh, um, uh, process uh, throughout. Wonderful. Um, and just kind of thinking about the process of selecting the site, I know Ultragenics you were looking, you know, for over maybe two years um, for a site. And from what I remember, you were looking at over a hundred sites. What in particular about this site and why did you choose Bedford? 
So Gil, I can take the first stab at that. So I think you have your numbers just about right. So when I joined the company, Gil had already done a lot of the legwork. He had already uh, compiled a list through our, our real estate service provider of over 100 sites. And so that was already being vetted. And then uh, around about February or, or March of, of last year, we um, narrowed that down to 20 sites and then RFP 10 and then negotiated pretty rigorously with four final sites. And um, each of the sites was very different from one another. They were different parts of the state. They were all, you know, part of, of the greater Boston area and they all part all had a, an established life science presence, but each site was different. Some were very urban, some were very rural. And um, at, the, at the end of the day, I think that um, the opportunity to customize our manufacturing site was really important um, rather than leasing a box or buying a box that already existed, the opportunity to build a, a box from scratch that fit our needs um, was important. The uh, The area was very important, the site, Lisa, you know the site very well. It's a beautiful site and um, that was really important in terms of corporate branding. I'm sure Tom Lausanne on, on the last panel mentioned the fact that in terms of recruiting, we already had established nearby in Woburn the fact that we could recruit really talented people to Woburn. And so with a little bit of study, it was determined that it wouldn't be that difficult to recruit to Bedford. There was already, you've already done a great job in attracting life science companies. So we were able, I think, to build upon that. So it was, it was pretty easy. We had other sites that were really good and we got very far down the line with them, but this was the one that, that made the most sense. And, and you've heard me say it a thousand times, Lisa, but I'll say it again. The fact that, that you and, and Sarah were involved it, it, Sarah, the fact that she had, had come, I think, from the city of Cambridge and knew what this was all about, that just gave us a, a certain higher level of comfort than dealing with some of the other towns. Yeah, just adding on to that, you know, I think <clears throat> coming into 2020, you know, our business was, um, you know, we're fast growing business, uh, a lot of changes. And, you know, we really hit an inflection point where, what our needs were dramatically changed at the end of 2019. So it really came into 2020, January 2nd, I think it was, where the gun went off, the starting gun for us in, in terms of that site search. So, you know, it, one of the amazing things to me over the, the course of this project, you know, from that January 2nd, 2020 to where we are now, um, the speed at which we're able to do it is absolutely, absolutely thrilled me. It's, it's absolutely thrilled the rest of our organization, both here and, you know, our corporate headquarters, which are based uh, in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. And, um, you know, when you think about it, yeah, we started from scratch on January 2nd, identified, broadly identified uh, well, over 100 sites. Um, and we did that purposefully because, you know, since speed was important to us, you know, we went under assumption that, you know, the site exists today. It's there today. It's available today. And we need to move on it. So we wanted to be really broad in what we looked at for existing and available properties. Uh, we formed a, an internal team, a uh, cross-functional team that identified a set of really, you know, important criteria to the business. And we took that forward to our leadership, um, enrolled them in the conversation because, you know, we're the, have a lot of pride and ownership of what we do here. So we wanna make sure that we enroll everybody in those types of decisions. So we set that criteria and then we, we um, you know, went after it. We just went, brought those hundred sites through this set of criteria, narrowed it, narrowed it, narrowed it, narrowed it down to, you know, key site visits. And within two months we were touring uh, I think four, maybe five sites, depending on how, how you count them, um, with our senior executive leadership team. And I'll, I'll never forget, it was February 24th. Um, we're out on the side of the road at Bedford Woods with the Gutierrez company, um, you know, Sarah, Elisa, and, it, you know, it was probably one of the most compelling uh, parts of the decision uh, was the amount of support that was immediately there. And, you know, it's the side of a road looking at a bunch of trees, but, you know, really uh, promised a tremendous commitment to, uh, you know, what we wanted to do. And um, I, I think that's critically important for others and other communities out there that might be listening in today on, on the question of, 
you know, what can communities do? And I think that that was just phenomenal. And not just being there, but very articulate about, you know, how the town was going to support us, how Guterres would support us, and how they would partner with our specific needs. So, um, you know, that was February 24th, uh, 2020. Um, about three days later, our entire company was quarantined. That was it. You know, so we went from, hey, you know, let's let's narrow it down um, from, you know, to four sites and, and you know, identify a preferred site to, you know, we're, we're not going to see each other for we don't know how long. And it turns out many of us haven't still seen each other. And, um, you know, I think it was almost a year to date. And I'll let Peter fill in some of the blanks between we topped off steel on the new facility. So, you know, I think it was February 26th, steel was topped off. So, you know, I went from a greenfield site to meeting the Guterres company, meeting the town of Bedford for the first time to having steel topped off. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And, um, you know, the, the, the whole company is really thrilled with, with the, our ability to, to, to pull that off as fast as we did under the conditions we're all working under. Exactly, exactly. And just to add a little bit more, just on the transaction, Gil, we went um, from negotiating four, you know, re really detailed lease proposals, right? And that was in June. And then all of a sudden we flipped over to a purchase arrangement and we had a, a, a letter of intent within six weeks of that. And then um, we closed in November on the site. So even that part of it was, was really condensed. And it was only because uh, Guterres was willing to, to help us accelerate the process, really. I mean, we would not have been able to do that had they not been as invested as we were. So I think, you know, already we're, you know, we're eight, 20 minutes into this and we've already emphasized a number of times the importance of the town and the importance of the partner, Guterres. Yeah, uh, um, I want to, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to oh. uh, jump in a, a little bit in, uh, on on the heels of that. Uh, um, I guess we were lucky we were meeting outside on the side of the road at the time we did, so we didn't have a super spreader event uh, um, <laughs> for meeting at the site. Um, but uh, I, Peter, you've already mentioned, you know, the, the value of the partnership, and we really appreciate that and appreciate working with you guys. Doesn't mean it was always easy. It, it was, there were hard negotiations along the, along the way, but uh, the idea of partnership, and I, I, I sort of see sort of three major components. There was certainly partnership, um, there was preparation, and ultimately, as, as Gil, you were talking about, you know, steel topping off, there's performance. Um, and those three components really come together. It was partnership working with Ultragenics, but working with the town and being prepared. So, uh, Elisa, we've talked in the past, you know, the Bedford Woods was a 43D site. It had accelerated permitting. We we did a lot of work to get the site ready to have the partnership with the town and the coordination with the town so that when you guys were ready, uh, Peter and Gil, and arrived at the site, there was there was a a, a unified message uh, between landowner, developer, um, and and the town, and that we could. Uh, you know, come together and all work together and then performance and, and obviously saying what you're going to do and doing it are important components. But anyone involved in real estate and construction knows that there's always, always problems, always, always problems that arise, road bumps and, and process, getting through the process with Bedford, getting through negotiations and, and getting deals in place um, really um, is important because of to, we could go back and rely on that partnership and have direct conversations and be able to work out any problems or difficulties and get over that. And, and all, all geared towards, uh, Gil, as, as you highlighted, you know, speed to market is so very important. And I know everybody recognizes that who touches life science market, whether it's R&D or, or um, manufacturing space. And I'm sure, Jay, you'll you'll weigh in on that. that. That speed to market is so very important and critical. And we recognize that with the groups that we're, we're partnering with. Um, so that, that's an important piece, whether you're coming out of the ground or, or renovating an existing, an existing space. So being in a position to deliver and getting there and getting there quickly is so very critical. And, and I think this team did it, it extraordinarily well. Yeah, shovel ready. 
you know, that was a key criteria. One of those key criteria, if you will recall, that, you know, behind the scenes, we were looking at, at everything and assessing the, you know, percent risk for each of the sites against being ready and being able to move fast. So, yeah, that's a great point, Scott, the work, the pre-work that you guys had done with the town to enable that site and get it ready to move quickly. And, um, you know, just for the audience that might not be aware of the, the different tools that we use um, for this site and really getting it prepared was the, the site was already pre-permitted for, um, for development of, you know, up to 180,000 square feet that was already pre-permitted. And the site was recently designated a Chapter 43D expedited permitting site um, for the town. And that is a special designation process through the state we worked with Gutierrez to um, get that designation. And so I think it just speaks to, uh, it speaks to the fact that we had done all this work pre before to have it shovel ready um, when Ultragenics expressed interest, which I think proved critical is what I'm hearing. <laughs> So, um, so I think that, you know, doing some of that pre-work is, was really helpful. Um, and then, you know, Jay, I'm just interested in getting your perspective on permitting and whether, you know, you work with a lot of life science companies. Are there things, you know, that, that are tracked um, life science companies to certain com communities in particular, sure. is it? Yeah, there certainly are. And the number one thing is uh, a uh, business friendly town, which, you know, uh, obviously Bedford is, you know, in, in the surrounding area. Uh, these towns have all had lots of development opportunities. They know what they don't want. They certainly know what they want. And then our clients show up and they are, they, they are like ultragenics. They know exactly what they want, but more importantly, they know exactly what they don't want. So there's a lot out there, especially uh, in this market of people trying to uh, reposition buildings. And although uh, there's a lot of buildings out there and there's a lot of uh, office buildings that people are trying to convert, not all of them are convertible. So when we're meeting with clients, the big stuff towns provide are, are things like you mentioned, the pre-approval process is huge. You know, you've already got the, the plot teed up. And then the other part is just the general infrastructure. An awful lot of deals go south because the landlords can't afford in the lease agreements to upgrade water or gas or electric services to the buildings and still meet their, their need to be within the budget of the rental um, process for each tenant coming in. So there's a little bit to go into it. And, and then again, not every building has the floor to floor heights. And when we get into things like uh, gene therapy or talking about uh, GMP facilities, you know, that's a whole different animal. We're talking about manufacturing and we're talking about much higher ceiling heights and roof heights and that type of stuff to, to fit in different things like, you know, we get into robotics and artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and you really got to know what your client's looking for in order to help them. So it's so important that the team, the architects, the engineers, the town, um, the planners, and frankly, the customers get on board early and obviously you get into the early release packages, steel and, and uh, rebar and concrete and get, get uh, long lead items uh, ferreted out and, and released early. And that just helps the transition of the process so much better. And then we say uh, people will enjoy the ride a whole lot more if it's planned well in the front end. And that's really what, and it sounds like, and congratulations to everybody, it sounds like this particular project has gone pretty well for everybody involved. And, you know, I, I, I got to give a round of applause to everybody. Good job. Thanks, Thanks Jay. Jay. Alisa, uh, Jay and, and, and Scott also mentioned this, that even with all that advanced planning, there were things that came up, you know, Bedford being part of the, uh, the greater Boston area. It's an old part of the country, right? And so um, there were all sorts of strings attached, uh, unknown strings attached, dis later discovered strings attached to the site because it was an old, old site. At one point, I thought that Scott was making stuff up, some of the things that was coming our way. But to their credit, they, you know, they had everything that was in their control, they had it all done in advance, as we just mentioned. And then they just jumped on any kind of issue that came up. We resolved them. 
But that's the difference, I think, between doing business here as opposed to the West Coast is that they're much younger there and they don't have all those kind of property restrictions on, on some of their parcels. Actually, that's a, that's a really good point. And I kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit more too, is um, Ultragenics is a, is a California company originally. And you know, you're coming to open up a, a huge facility in Massachusetts. Um, what were some of the differences or what do you see as some of the differences um, from California, you know, permitting versus Massachusetts? And I do remember there was some back and forth with California and just kind of getting a, 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 some comfort level about some of the, the permits and, and terms that we use here. So I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I actually started my career in California as an assistant planner for the city of Pleasanton. So I, I have some familiarity, but I'm just interested to, from hearing from your perspective. Yeah, I think, it, you know, folks within our company, you know, they've had a lot of experience as well in a number of different areas. And it's not just California versus Massachusetts, it's really the community you're in in both those locations. And, you know, it, even here, some communities are better than others. And, uh, you know, in terms of stepping up and really helping facilitate this type of permitting process. So, um, you know, I think on the earlier call, um, you know, the community here um, and the number of different resources that are out there that are willing to step up and help, you know, through Mass Life Sciences, Mass Econ, um, you know, we were talking to a number of those organizations throughout. And, um, you know, I think from my perspective, uh, you know, I benefited from the fact that I grew up here in the biopharmaceutical neighborhood in Massachusetts. Um, there, there, there is a lot of resource here. Um, you know, I'd say, uh, you know, all companies aren't created equal, you know, come with different uh, backgrounds and experiences and needs. And I, I, I do think it, sometimes it can be overwhelming because there's so many um, organizations that are willing to help. And um, j just having kind of a, a single point of contact that's plugged in and that knows, and you know, or organizations like M3 and this one, you know, this exercise we're doing today, I, I think build that over time and build that knowledge of, oh wait, uh, you know, I learned about this organization that helps, um, you know, companies do X, right? because there's, there's a lot of resource here. Um, I don't necessarily see that in the communities that we're in on, on the West Coast. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes it gets a little complicated, but there's a lot out there and, you know, having somebody to help navigate it, like yourself, Elisa, <laughs> um, and Scott, uh, you know, was really helpful to us. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, shifting gears a little bit, talking about sustainability and, um, you know, and how this project incorporates any kind of sustainable features. I know life science buildings in particular are, are large users of, you know, electricity, water, sewer, and just kind of thinking about what are ways that um, this project and Jay, you know, if you can chime in from a, you know, overall constructed construction um, perspective, you know, what are ways that sustain sustainability is incorporated? Well, I think uh, when we look at the buildings today and most of our clients today in, in the state of Massachusetts, if you if you just follow the, the regular building code, that'll get you to a lead silver, right? So, and, it, and, it's, and it's important to most of our clients. Most of them want to be, you know, somewhere, you know, they all want to be platinum, but you know, nobody really wants to pay for platinum. So we get into lead gold and lead silver an awful lot. Um, the latest and greatest thing we see on sustainability and things like that is people are getting into well is another program that that has started um, that has to do with a healthy environment within the building and and uh, you know it, it kind of dovetails into lead and sustainability and that type of stuff and then the next level of that that has hit the market is uh, is called uh, fit well and that incorporates a fitness component into your working environment and into your lead requirements so it's all serious business and most of these companies that are out there especially the high tech and the life science companies are really dialed into this stuff and the reason it's come to the forefront is of course you know our millennial generation that that is now our workforce they don't want to work in a lab with one window and uh, four five six seven eight benches 
you know, when you see daylight, maybe, maybe uh, for 15 minutes a day when you write note a report, they want to be able to see what's going on around them. So there's a lot of glass, those types of things, much more open uh, space. You know, obviously COVID isn't helping that. They want a much more modular space. They want to have huddle rooms and things like that. And, and all of that kind of builds a healthy environment to work. And so, you know, as you go through these, these uh, plans we see and, and the nuances to them, there's a lot more social area in these new lab buildings, a lot more light coming in, you know, and obviously that helps on the other side, the energy of the buildings and that type of stuff. And uh, all these buildings are getting much more energy efficient. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure to have energy efficient buildings and that type of stuff. We see a lot more solar panels and, and uh, different uh, pieces of equipment to capture uh, energy loss and all those kinds of things. We get into LED lighting and all of that type of stuff. So overall, we're seeing the actual consumption by these plants and facilities is, is going down, even though the footprints are getting larger. But that's some of the things that, as to how we're getting into sustainability. It's really being not only pushed by the companies, but also the employees coming in the door. And I would just I would just throw in there um, uh, to follow up on Jay. I think there's a, a bit of a need to understand. We talk about life sciences, we talk about labs, we talk about different facilities. There's there's like office space is not all exactly the same. There's there's a wide range of different facilities we're talking about. The facility that for ultragenics that. Uh, we're currently building is a manufacturing facility. It does have labs of, and office support areas as part of it. Um, but that's a very, these are very, very unique and specialized facilities as I'm sure Gil can go into extraordinary detail about the processes and the piping and everything that goes into it. Um, the very, very different than lab space for life science uh, alone. Certainly lab space has become a little bit more uh, standardized, modularized uh, um, in terms of the pro uh, approach that we have there. But when you get into um, really uh, drug production, cell and gene therapy production of medicines, um, uh, it's, it's really, really highly specialized, uh, unique materials uh, and processes that need to be put in place. And uh, require a range of considerations in, in terms of sustainability versus what you need to, to produce, uh, efficiently produce uh, the medicines as well. So we have, so again, being a California company, there's a huge emphasis on outdoor space, as you can well imagine. And for offices and labs, certainly looking at using rooftops, um, you know, making sure that the employees have nice views, that they can go outside, have their meetings outside, et cetera, et cetera. They, they're still trying to wrap their heads around the fact that we have snow in April. Um, but, but I'm not sure, I asked Gil, Gil, is, is that how important for the manufacturing use as opposed to an office and lab use is that outdoor space? What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it definitely is important to, have these spaces that people can, you know, get outside. I think you mentioned it, you know, need to have some light. Um, and we wanted to have a facility that, you know, wasn't just a box that you make stuff in that would attract and retain, you know, talent, key talent um, to make these critical medicines in the facility. So um, those things are still very important to us, even though we are limited by our, regional considerations there, Peter. So, but we, uh, we did try to incorporate what we could in, into, into the facility design to create some of these nooks and niches and spaces where people can come together. Um, we've, you know, found that it drives collaboration to a much better extent than if you didn't have these spaces. You know, on the sustainability side, the company is uh, critically committed to it. Um, just launching, um, you know, a, a senior level program on sustainability and social awareness around this, you know, from a manufacturing perspective, you know, really you know, the best thing we can do is take a look at how we're how we manufacture, right? And, it, you know, being part of the, the biopharmaceutical industry for 30 years, you know, we would have huge facilities with large stainless steel vessels making metric tons of material, right? 
So the technologies that we're bringing to market now with cell therapy, with gene therapy, which is what we're engaged in, the scale of the manufacturing is shrinking dramatically. So our overall footprint as a company, and, you know, think about, you know, ultimately we're trying to cure patients. So what's our, what's our you know, carbon footprint in order to cure patients? So um, leveraging, you know, science to get us there is probably the, the biggest thing we can do. And a specific facility design, Jay hit upon it, you know, it, it's lead silver is our base. And, you know, first, we, what we have to do is make sure that we're designing the facility to meet, you know, safety requirements for the products that we're manufacturing there. Once we've done that, then we go after any and all technologies that are available to us today or emerging to help, you know, um, do that in an ed- energy efficient manner. But really, you know, the the, the CGMP design aspects of a facility like this need to come first because our patients and our pa- the, the safety of our patients comes first. And then outside that context, we look for the most energy efficient way to, to attack it. Another thing I wanted to touch on as well is this project was planned and permitted um, you know, during an unusual time of COVID-19. Um, so I am wondering how the facility design changed, um, you know, from maybe an original plan, how it might have changed to adapt to this um, situation that we're in. And if those changes are, are seen to be permanent um, or if they are, you know, temporary measures. Yeah, so I can speak to that. Um, they're still changing, Elisa, <laughs> as, as we're, we're going through this and we're learning about return to work and, and what that means. Um, Just the whole experience of the past year, everybody's learned a lot about, you know, different work environments, different work situations. But in general, you know, we took a pretty pragmatic approach uh, in the facility design, Um, you know, in terms of manufacturing spaces, typically those designs are very robust from a cleanliness and a, you know, protection standpoint, because the process and the product demands that. So really we focused in the office environments and, you know, just the simple things as much hands-free as we could. Um, We wanted flexible office design that could be reconfigured easily to to shift from a pandemic mode to a non-pandemic mode, because, you know, even in the design process, we did not see us living in pandemic forever, right? So we wanted the ability to reconfigure and, and flex that space easily to what we were learning as, well, how do we manage our facilities during a pandemic? So we learned a lot as part of that, and we kind of built that into the basis of design of the facility. Um, You know, in terms of HVAC, um, increased outside air, increased filtration in the office spaces. Um, We look at air distribution to make sure that we're, you know, flushing um, flushing the areas, uh, you know, well. So, you know, just a just really good HVAC design to make sure that there, there's a, a good amount of fresh air in the in, in the office spaces. Yeah. Jay, I was wondering um, if, if you wanted to speak to that as well in terms of what you're seeing from clients, um, you know, adapting to this. Yeah, what we're seeing is, you know, and, and as we, you know, get into this stuff and we, and, you know, again, we get back to talking about these existing buildings versus new and a lot of the existing buildings, you know, we, for, for this lab stuff we need, it's going to be double the structural requirements. It's almost triple the electrical requirements and that type of stuff. So when you're trying to do one of these facilities and, and Gil hit, hit a, the nail on the head, it's really about you have a contained area that you're doing some manufacturing in. And what we see in this gene therapy and what Peter alluded to is a lot of these facilities are fairly small. But again, you're still dealing with a contained area. And obviously the, the most important thing is to keep the product safe for the end user, as Gil pointed out. But at the same time, we got to try to make this place energy efficient and make it work. It's going to work for the manufacturer. It's going to work for the workers. It's going to work uh, for everybody involved. So at the end of the day, you know, the uh, costs to run it aren't ab- absorbent. And um and so a lot of planning is going to go into it, you know, the design side of it. Uh, these guys have done it a lot. And it's so important to have that team that you guys put together that's really on it. And they understand what everybody's looking for early on 
and that just makes the project so much so much more successful and you know we get into we get into gene therapy most of our clients these days it's a lot like micro brews they're doing really small batch technology here and you know we're getting to the point you know i'm sure we're not there yet these guys could tell you better than me but you know we're getting into this designer gene therapy and that's really almost like a micro brew beer company you know you're really putting out the small batch type stuff but again it gets back to designing the facility to meet the needs and understanding what we're making there so we can build it, build it efficiently and, and help it to run efficiently in the long run. Because guys like Ultragenics, they're going to keep this facility for a while. They're not developing it to spin it off and sell it to somebody. It's, it's going to be their home. So their facilities guys are going to say, yeah, we could buy that type of HVAC equipment, which isn't as great a long-term investment as say using this other one that has a much more longer uh, longevity. So they're going to make the bigger investment into, the, into those types of products because they're going to hang on and retain the, the plant. Just as long as uh, I keep my micro brews in my can and my <laughs> medicines in my syringe, you know, let's keep those those separate. I just wanted to throw out a comment, uh, Elisa. I thought maybe this is uh, part of where you were going too, with the the pandemic uh, and the process through this. Because it, as Gil said, you know, met out at the site directly, and then three days later, people are starting to shut down and and go online. And certainly, a lot of groups and we've all learned a lot and adjusted and modified throughout this process. You know, given the you know. The, the webinar type format that we're in now today, as opposed to in person. Um, but the ability for the town to pivot, I know we went through, uh, I think the town went through an outdoor town meeting <laughs> at that time first. Uh, we're having another one on Saturday, yes. Yeah, uh, first at, at that time. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, risky and, and rescheduled and delayed and all of that. Right. Um, we went to online uh, permit meetings. As we said, it's a pre-permitted site, but we had to modify and adjust it to be responsive to Ultragenics specific needs and design. So we went from a, a, a very different uh, layout to where we are now with, with Ultragenics and the town was able to pivot and started there. This was at the beginning of the pandemic. Lots of communities have since adjusted, but uh, the town was able to adjust and start their online meetings and we were doing this type of work. And as we go forward, I think a lot of the, the design for spaces in buildings are now actually thinking and incorporating some of this pandemic induced technology that we all seem to have a laptop and a camera or something in our home offices and we go to the our regular office or our home workspace, we go to our our, um, our office space and suddenly we log in and um, there's no camera and this doesn't work and I can't go to the conference room. And so obviously a lot of newer spaces are now being, being delivered in fully, um, uh, fully uh, uh, audio video uh, conference capabilities now. Uh, we've done that a lot with uh, recent uh, projects and clients as, as well so that you can sort of merge these together. And there's certain benefits from, from getting together our design team meetings where you have people from all over the place, you've eliminated the you know, hour plus more drive to get to a meeting um, and, and drive both ways. And you can log on and go over plans and share information and mark them up with Bluebeam and, and, and all that. It's, it's, it's inc there's some productivity advantages even though we we recognize we've we've lost a lot of collaboration uh, opportunities uh, through this time, so I think the the world as we go forward is going to definitely continue to be a hybrid uh, of where we've been. But a lot of success that we were able to achieve uh, through collectively through the this pandemic um, uh, because of the ability to to coordinate and collaborate and get online and and do it daily as needed and multiple times a week through this process with, with the community and with Ultragenics and the design teams. Yeah, Scott, that's other... an interesting point. I mean, it's almost like some of those tools really maybe enabled the 
project to go faster in some ways. It, that, that, that might have actually been a helpful thing to have more Absolutely. online meetings Absolutely. and capabilities. Jay, were you going to say something? I, I was just going to say that the, the best thing I think that happened to us that we all grumped about when it first came out was uh, most of the building permit applications have now been turned into an electronic submittal. And uh, we all griped about that back when, uh, when it all started. But frankly, uh, that's been a godsend during this pandemic. It's really helped everybody because, uh, you know, the plans were, were reviewed remotely by somebody at the other end of the Dropbox, right? So it's actually been very helpful for us. We have some questions in the chat and I want to give people a little bit of time, um, you know, opportunity to, to answer them. Um, Joyce Blatt asks, uh, the speed of this process and delivery is very impressive. How were you able to supersede the problems that developed in regard to the production of product and supply chain for construction? So that, the, uh, I'll take a piece of that anyway. Um, that has been uh, a definite challenge that it we're not out of yet. A lot of um, supply chain issues are actually continuing to be realized as we go forward. Uh, we've had a couple of projects, this one and others, and I'm sure Jay can comment on, on this as well, where um, it, it has been we need to keep a very open mind and an open process on how and what we're, we're procuring for materials and, and components, certainly for these buildings, uh, because production lines throughout the country and beyond our country have been uh, significantly affected by, by pandemic shutdowns, the orders are delayed, and components that go into other components, you know, your chip your computer chip, as we've all heard, there's there's limitations and reductions in capacity for making cars because of lack of computer chips. Well, the computer chips also run those HVAC units and and a lot of other uh, specialized equipment. So it is working to identify those long lead items as early as possible, ordering them, identifying them, staying on top of it and working with your supply chain. Um, but it, it is, definitely challenging and uh, a component that our construction team spends a lot of time focused on um, is, is to maintain schedule. Scott, were there any advantages caused by the pandemic as far as sourcing materials? Was anything all of a sudden less expensive or was it all just negative? <laughs> yeah, uh, from, from a construction standpoint, I don't think there was there's been any benefit. Certainly, you know, some of the design coordination, I think we, we, we talked about a little bit. Um, but I think that the issues, when the pandemic and the shutdown first hit, we had some projects that were underway. This one wasn't quite underway. And there was a lot of uncertainty. And we were able to lock in some things and get deliveries on things that some projects stopped and others were continuing to able to, to move forward. And that was good. The, the delayed production, I think, is actually just coming more to light now as, as the economy is getting a little bit more robust and projects are certainly underway and there's more growth and there's a lack of supply. So I think the, the potential uh, lack, it's, it's sort of equivalent to as we reduce restrictions and restaurants get back to, to uh, serving more people, there are fewer servers and cooks and chefs and everything available and that's where we're in you know, overall into the into the uh, supply chain at the moment there's just less material out there and a lot more competition for it so unfortunately i haven't seen the bright side yet a lot of pricing is going up uh, lumber three times what it was and um, yeah I, I think the only uh, the only upside to production is toilet paper is back on the shelves at the supermarket but but it, to add on to what Scott had to say, uh, right now we, you know, we're running into a bunch of stuff. You know, prices are climbing. Wood, if anybody hasn't double hasn't noticed, is uh, just dimensional lumber alone has doubled. Plywood has gone up about six hundred percent practically, and uh, some different products. But we're also having a struggle with drywall deliveries. Um, insulation is becoming a problem, and and even a strange item you wouldn't think would have affect the construction industry there's no fly ash 
for, for concrete fillers and that type of stuff. There's a nationwide shortage of fly ash, which is kind of an odd one that people don't think of, but that, that has a direct effect on, on concrete and how it affects the concrete. If you're doing mass pours, fly ash is what helps keep the uh, temperature of hydration down. And so now they're using different products and it's not as good a product to help keep it down. So there's, a, there's some oddball things out there too, but in general, most stuff has gone significantly up in price. I have another question from the chat. Um, as Ultragenics is a California-based company, will Ultragenics and Gutierrez consider decarbonization as part of the design process by minimizing seat steel and concrete high carbon dioxide producing materials, for example, to lessen the carbon dioxide into the environment. Will Ultragenics and Gutierrez consider net zero carbon as a goal or even consider to help the fight against climate change? Yeah, I can take, take it from the Ultragenics side, Scott can fall. Um, yeah, as I said, we just recently committed to um, you know, global sustainability and social awareness uh, program. We're beginning to develop that strategy now. And, you know, Ultragenics will look at it company-wide, globally. I'm not sure that that particular area in terms of concrete and steel will be an area that we can make the most gains. Um, as we move forward as a life sciences company, we're definitely committed to it and are going to look at a number of different opportunities um, you know, to, to significantly reduce or eliminate our carbon footprint. Great. Yeah, and um, I, I think just to add on that, you know, specifically and directly on, on, on steel and concrete, um, there are definitely uh, challenges at the moment in, in realistic replacements to those, to those products. So what we seek to do is is um, provide a more environmentally sustainable approach to locally source steel production uh, as 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 best as we can, and and to be able to um, you know consider alternative filler products like uh, Jay was mentioning uh, for concrete and the like, so that you can minimize the carbon footprint. But I don't think uh, we're yet at a, in a position where we can fully just eliminate them from from a, um, a, a commercial building project. Yeah, and if, and if there are any other participants that wanna throw questions in the chat, you can do so now and we can try to pick up um, as many as we can. There was a comment here about how and when the site plan approval process fit in for a pre-permit 43D scenario. Um, so I think the question is how does site plan review do you still have to do site plan review if you have a pre-permitted site? Um, we did still have to do the site plan review process because um, the, the pre-permitted site, it was pre-permitted for a building that was, you know, 180,000 square feet. Um, but the actual building and the actual project was different than that. It was a different building, um, it was a different square footage, it was a different shape on the site. Um, so it did have to go through a site plan review process um, to basically as a, a modification of the existing site plan. And um, the chapter 43D scenario still applies because that site plan review process and all the subsequent um, permitting would all still need to be completed within a 180 day time frame. It was actually completed in you know, more like a two months time frame. So, you know, much quicker than that, but it's always good when it was really helpful in, in having the, the designation for chapter 43D too, to just signal to uh, companies, you know, that are in different states, different locations that Bedford has a, this process straightforward and that we're not gonna, we're gonna complete all the permitting within a certain time frame. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Elisa, I'd just uh, uh, add on to that because I think I think your summary was great. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it's exactly the same kind of conversation that maybe we had had some time ago and we've had in other communities where the Guterres company's uh, position is to always pre-permit uh, our properties so that we are ready, shovel ready to move forward. That is not 
to be dismissive of the fact that when a, a user comes along, a group comes along that wants to occupy the space, they may have modifications to the, to the, um, to the approved layout. And so when we're in a lot of communities and we're pre-permitting and then we say, well, let's tack on a 43D designation for these properties as well. The communities may be asking us, well, why bother? You've already permitted um, the, the project and it's for that exact reason. And it's so that Elisa, you and Sarah and the entire Bedford team can meet out on the side of a street with Ultragenics and be able to say, not only has this site been permitted, but the community is behind it and, and committed to addressing your needs in a very expedited fashion. So it's, it's all about communicating that, that, that preparedness um, uh, to a potential uh, tenant uh, client user as well. And Elisa, I don't know if you covered it in the first panel, but um, we should probably just give a shout out to the state of Massachusetts as well, just because, um, you know, at the governor's office and state reps, they, they did what they needed to do. Um, they were not picking sides on any of the sites that we were looking at, but they were advocating as appropriate. And it was just, it was indicative of a state that's very experienced in these matters. Another question. I'd, I'd, oh, echo, I'd echo and give a shout out to Bedford's rep as well, uh, Ken Gordon, who's uh, been very supportive uh, to help uh, move process uh, and and reviews along where where needed in coordination with the with the uh, um, with the various state entities and agencies involved. Yeah, I also really appreciate all the, the work the state has done in Massachusetts Office of Business Development and Peter Milano. They're always so helpful and, and willing to help out communities, you know, working with companies. And so I think that's a real asset um, for the communities as well. Um, and so I have, uh, I think we have time for one, one more question. Um, what stage is the design in? Did Erland provide a GMP? If so, what impact is the shortage in the supply chain already discussed have on the cost of a 100,000 square foot manufacturing facility? And will a GMP be revised? Maybe you know the answer to that question. I'm not sure exactly, but. Um, yeah, I probably can answer that if you want. Yeah. Yes, please. Excuse me. Yeah. Just from the, this specific project, um, you know, we, we did a design assist approach, uh, early engagement of our major trade partners in advancing the detailed design. Um, so what we did is we awarded um, uh, lump sum bids for the design and long lead material purchases um, back several months ago. And, you know, once we complete the detailed model for the facility, then we'll move to um, uh, lump sum contracts in more of a GMP uh, situation. So. Um, that was done so we could enroll our major trade par partners in the process as early as possible, knowing that we may be um, facing both uh, material and labor shortages due to, due to the pandemic, um, but also giving us the ability to later on lock in some firm pricing. Jay, Thanks, uh, Gil. just wanted to give the context for this specific project. And I think that's a great way to, to end the conversation as well, too, that there's, there's certainly a, a lot going on, um, a, a lot happening in the area. So um, so thank you, um, uh, Elisa, great conversation. Um, th thank you to, to, to our panel, Peter, Scott, Gil, Jay, uh, appreciate all the information. Um, and, and Ultragenics, welcome to the area as well. You're obviously in great hands. Um, what, two things that I didn't hear uh, mention. Oh, actually, though, um, Elisa, if you could put your contact information also in the chat, because I have a feeling people are going to follow up with you with other uh, information. Actually, if everybody can put their information in the chat, whatever information you want in, in the chat, and we'll send that out to everybody in a follow up email. Uh, but two things I, I didn't hear uh, mentioned as much as what we did on, with the prep was the, the uh, transportation piece and the workforce development piece as well, too. Uh, but I think when you guys get to those parts, you'll be reaching out to Elisa as well, too. And hopefully she'll mention the Middlesex 3 TMA and the shuttle service that we have. As, and I know you're working with Middlesex um, Community College as well, too. Um, so it sounds like you guys are, are in, in great shape. And uh, 
I, I look forward to, to the ribbon cutting. Scott, we having a ribbon cutting? Can't wait. <laughs> right. Wonderful. And Rick, again, I jumped in front of you, so I'm gonna hand it back over to you. That's quite all right, Stephanie. You know, we, we have been a team for a number of years and we, you know, we work well together we no matter what. <laughs> I want to thank Alyssa and uh, the rest of the uh, panel. Great job today. Lots of great information. Uh, before we end the day, I want to thank our sponsors one more time, which are platinum sponsors, Reamer and Bronstein, uh, Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, our corporate sponsors, U.S. Pavement Services, Ultragenics Pharmaceutical, Erlen Construction, The Gutierrez Company, Northmark, Allen & Major Associates, Inc., UCB, Windover Construction, and Moggle Architects. I want to thank them all for sponsoring this event. I want to thank everyone for attending, and I want to wish everyone a happy Wednesday. Wonderful, thank you. And again, thank, thank you, you to, to our moderator, Elisa Sandoval, and, and our, our panel, I appreciate all of you. Um, Jay, Peter, Scott, Gil, thank you, and, and have a great day, everybody. Thanks to all, Thanks bye, -bye. everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. You guys have a good day.